The Trumpet Daily from Jerusalem. Earlier this year, Stephen Fleury, his family, and five Herbert W. Armstrong College students and alumni established a regional office for the Philadelphia Church of God in Jerusalem, Israel. Over the next six months, The Trumpet Daily produced 80 episodes and updates, filming from various locations throughout Jerusalem and elsewhere in Israel. Today's episode is a compilation of The Trumpet Daily's work in Israel. everyone and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. We're reporting to you today from one of the oldest cities in the world, Jerusalem. Behind me is the famous Jaffa Gate, which enters the old city of Jerusalem from the west. The city of Jerusalem was established over 3,000 years ago. Today there's a lot of tension surrounding Israel, the West Bank, and this city. It seems everyone has an opinion on the history of Israel, on the history of Jerusalem. The Jews consider this their ancient homeland. For Christians and Muslims, the city of Jerusalem is home to some of their most holiest and revered sites. But what does God have to say about Israel and about Jerusalem? What are the origins of this city behind me? On Tuesday afternoon, thetrumpet.com attended a press conference at Media Central in Jerusalem for former Hamas supporter turned Israeli informant Mossab Hassan Yosef. Mossab was born in 1978 in Ramallah to a devoutly Islamic family. As the eldest son of Sheikh Hassan Yosef, one of the seven founding fathers of Hamas, Mossab has first-hand experience of life inside the terrorist organization which he expounds on in his autobiography, Son of Hamas, a gripping account of terror, betrayal, political intrigue, and unthinkable choices. As we see what's happening in Egypt right now, do you think it's accidentally that I had to witness the birth of Hamas that was born in the womb of the Muslim Brotherhood? Which is no, there's no difference. There is no difference between Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. When the Muslim Brotherhood won the elections yesterday in Egypt. This means that Hamas took over Egypt. God called Israel out of this world to be a model nation. A job that it failed to do, by the way. It became a miserable failure and went into captivity. Of course, before that, it divided into two nations, Israel and Judah. And if you really are serious about doing something dramatic to solve the problems that we see, you've got to go back to the cause, the core. And that, of course, is the family. We're facing the greatest danger that this country, America, I mean, uh, that this country has ever faced. And even though we have enemies all around us on the outside, this great danger is caused primarily because of the bitter division from within. Hello again everyone, this is Stephen Fleury reporting from Jerusalem. Earlier this week my wife and I attended a special screening of Teddy's Museum, a new film about former Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kollek's dream to establish a museum that would rival the leading cultural institutions of the world. Today that dream is known as the Israel Museum, which you can see behind me. Some have called this the Holy Temple of Israeli Culture. Samuel and his family 
dwelt in Ramah, a city which is located about five or six miles north of Jerusalem. Now it's a little hard to pinpoint exactly where the ancient city of Ramah might be located today, but we've tried uh, with this particular location to get just as close as we can. Behind me you can see the northern outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. Now it says here in verse 1 that Samuel's father dwelt in Ramathaim Zophim, as I said, which means the two high places of the watchmen, perhaps signifying the old and new cities of Ramah uh, anciently. Today I'm speaking to you from the Valley of Elah, the site of David's famous confrontation with Goliath, which is recorded in 1 Samuel 17. Elah means oak or terebrinth, a tree that's common here in the Mediterranean region. Now east of this valley, not far from here, is a dullum where David, along with 400 of his men, hid in caves when Saul was trying to kill him. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 22. There's also a fascinating excavation located at Kirbat Kiafa, right here in the Elah Valley, just a little ways to my right. It's yet another dig that's been uncovering a lot of evidence that supports the biblical account of a united monarchy under King David. For today's program, we're going to focus on a story that nearly everyone knows, but almost no one believes, the epic battle between David and Goliath. Hello everyone, welcome back to a very, very special Trumpet Daily Update for the YouTube channel. We brought the whole crew here with us today. We did a little bit of exploring, trying to find this location, a, a stunning backdrop really for a, a Trumpet Daily that we just filmed a, a little bit ago. We're overlooking the Valley of Elah, which is just behind us. The northern hill on the other side of the valley would have been where the Israelites encamped uh, there in 1 Samuel 17 before uh, David approached and brought uh, food to uh, his brothers. And then, of course, heard uh, uh, Goliath in the valley uh, shouting all of these defiant uh, jabs at the Israelites. And, uh, of course, that led to the epic battle between David and Goliath. This particular hill that we're standing on right now, just to pick up a few of the facts in uh, verse 1 of chapter 17, it says the Philistines gathered uh, their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah. And uh, Harley's best estimate is that Shoko would have been situated about where we are, and Azekah is just a little ways down to our right. So it's, uh, it's almost 7 o'clock here in Israel. The sun is setting, so you can see we'll pan out here toward the end where you can see uh, just the beauty of this backdrop. But we've had a good time. We don't generally bring all nine of us on TV tapings, but this was a special day for us. I think you would all agree with that. Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, this is Stephen Flurry reporting with all of my friends from the Valley of Elah. Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Even today when you walk through the ruins of what used to be the Roman city of Caesarea, you can sense that during the days of Jesus Christ and the first century church, this city behind me must have been one of the most splendid and modern harbor towns in all the world. Caesarea is situated on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, about halfway between the Israeli cities of Tel Aviv to our south and Haifa to the north. Now, toward the end of the first century BC, Herod the Great built this city over the course of 12 years and then changed the name to Caesarea in honor of Augustus Caesar. It then became the capital city of the Roman province that included Jerusalem, which is about 55 miles southeast from here. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, 
Herod erected many edifices with great diligence throughout this city. The greatest of these was the artificial harbor he built right into the sea. He designed this innovative harbor because ships arriving at smaller ports near Caesarea couldn't dock along the shoreline because of the waves and the underwater drifts of sand that would push up against the shoreline. And so Herod decided to build an artificial harbor by lowering these massive stone slabs into the sea in order to break the waves and to stand as a barrier against the rolling sands. The history in and around the Sea of Galilee changed the world forever. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, lived in this very land after being born in Bethlehem. He allowed his heavenly glory to be peeled from him to fulfill his Father's awesome plan. The ministry of Christ took place mainly in the Galilee region, right around this very sea. He even had a home in Capernaum, which is located right along the northern shore of uh, the sea here. You can see that in Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. Again, this is Stephen Flurry speaking to you from the Ophel Excavation Site in Jerusalem. Since 2006, Armstrong College has provided volunteers for Dr. Elat Mazar to help excavate here in Jerusalem at the City of David from 2006 to 2009 and right here at the Ophel from 2009 to today. Now, this relationship between the namesake of our college and the Mazar family actually goes back more than four decades. Okay, so I'm here on top of a, we're on top of a Byzantine uh, monastery structure, a terrace overlooking what was the Temple Mount excavations from back in the late 60s and during the 1970s. And of course, I'm with Dr. Elat Mazar, the granddaughter of uh, Benjamin Mazar, the one who got all of this started. And as I told you earlier, I, I familiarized the audience with a little bit of that history between your grandfather and Mr. Armstrong and the ambassadors and then now the students from Armstrong College. And so if you could now fill in some of the details on just the, the enormity of this excavation itself, uh, what took place over the decades and how it led into uh, where we happen to be digging right now. It's a lot to cover. It's, can, it's, uh, a, long, it's a long story. It. It's really a long story. But the most prominent uh, features now to look at, first is the southern wall of the Temple Mount. This is the most impressive structure. And we are just at the, at the foot of this uh, uh, southern wall of the Temple Mount, which is Second Temple period. We're talking about a structure that was saved and so impressively built 2,000 years ago by King Herod. And at the foot, all this area around us, it's part of the Temple Mount excavations, excavated by my grandfather, and so many people contributed their part in it. Uh, what we are standing on, for instance, is a Byzantine structure. So this is later, this is much later, this is 1,600 years later than the southern wall of the Temple Mount. But this area is called Ophel. Ophel means, it's a biblical term for Acropolis. And from the time, we suspect, from the time of King David, this area served as Acropolis. But during the centuries, in the Second Temple period, and later on during the Roman and Byzantine and early Islamic periods, everybody you know, added their 
constructions as they needed it. Three people in the apartment just behind me uh, were killed this morning and also an eight-month-old baby was injured. So this has been the primary spot that took the most damage and you can see all the, the uh, news media gathering around across the street. Now of course many reports will say these attacks are in response to Israel's pillar of defense operation, but uh, before Israel acted in self-defense, it was actually Hamas that had been itching for a fight by ramping up its barrage of rocket fire in recent weeks. Now, when that happened back in 2005, many people, many commentators, said the evacuation of Gaza would be the first step toward achieving peace in the Middle East. Leaving Gaza would pave the way for a Palestinian state to coexist right alongside Israel. That's what so many were saying. But what is the reality? What has happened instead? Well, instead, Israel's departure opened the door for Hamas to take over and to establish a terrorist camp right next to Israel. Since 2005, Hamas has launched more than 8,000 rockets into Israel. Since 2005, Israel has gone to war against Gaza, it seems every few years, just to try to dismantle the terrorist infrastructure. I want to refer you to a couple of verses here today, Hosea 5 and verse 13 to begin with. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Today we're reporting from southern Israel alongside its border with Gaza. Behind me you have a pretty good view of the northern stretches of the Gaza city that runs right up to, uh, to the uh, borderline with uh, Israel. And as we now know, in the Strip, Gaza Strip, there's hundreds of terrorist installations that Israel has been targeting for the past several days. Now this is quite a sophisticated operation. And for the past four weeks, Israel's been working to break up the supply line. So that's the context that we need to keep in mind when viewing the events of this past week here in Israel and over in Gaza. Both Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, the New York Times points out, both of them are, are receiving and building weapons with the help of weapons experts from Iran. To quote again from the Times, it says, one official here said that until Israel ended its military occupation of Gaza in 2005, there were only primitive weapons factories there. The Hamas rockets had a flight capacity of about a mile. Uh, they could not be aimed, and they flew in a wild cylindrical pattern. Hamas then built better rockets that could fly up to 12 miles. And then the Times points out that changed uh, little until 2007 when Hamas fighters pushed the Fatah-dominated Palestinian Authority out of Gaza into the West Bank and took over governing the coastal strip. Now at that point, Jabari, he was the, the head military commander of the Hamas military wing, Jabari turned his neighborhood defense operation into a real army. You can hear an explosion behind me uh, in this ongoing war that's uh, now happening between Gaza and, uh, and Israel. But to go back to this quote from the New York Times, but be assured that the Iranian king is clearly, clearly gaining strength all across the Middle East and North Africa. And Bible prophecy says that this rapid spread of radical Islam will continue until it finally collides with the German-led European Union now, it may seem unlikely right now, but Germany will soon become a central figure and player in the events in this very region. And so you stay tuned. You keep logging on to thetrumpet.com. You keep checking in with The Trumpet Daily. And of course, most importantly, with the Key of David television program. We thank you for joining us today. As always, this is Stephen Flurry reporting to you right at the border with Israel and Gaza reporting to you for the Trumpet Daily.